So we're in a warm and sunny Madrid for Fuse 2023. I'm here with Maria Cuevas. She is Networks Research Director and BT Distinguished Engineer. Maria, thanks so much for joining us today. Great to see you. So, you know, we're at the, the Fuse event, second year. A lot of people talking here about what R&D work needs to be done in the industry. What do you think are the most important aspects of telecom network R&D right now? Yeah, I mean, uh, it's a fascinating space, as, as you said, uh, loads of new technologies. Um, in BT, we tend to focus on uh, the technologies that help us operate uh, our networks uh, in a much more, um, uh, well, better way, uh, optimal, uh, if you like. Um, but we also look at opportunities for growth, okay? So I can, I can pick examples of, of both, if that helps. For the optimization, I think the, for, by far the most important thing for us is sustainability. Uh, at the moment. Uh, BT, as you probably know, has a net zero target uh, by March 2031 uh, and we're determined to, uh, to meet uh, that target uh, and we're already doing many things uh, across the network of course to, uh, to get there uh, all the way from using renewable energies to um, having um, all sorts of technologies to um, um, reduce uh, effectively energy consumption. But from our research perspective what we look at is the next generation of uh, technologies that can help us improve in that space. I can provide two examples. Um, sure. So we've recently announced a uh, technology called liquid cooling uh, that can help us effectively immerse uh, servicing fluid uh, and we're in the middle of effectively rolling out a trial to test the benefits of the technology, how feasible is it, uh, what impact does it have in the, the way we operate, uh, obviously our data centers, uh, but we are great believers in the, in the benefits that it can offer and we're investing, if you like, a lot of uh, our research, if you like, talent on, on that topic. Um, a very different, uh, perhaps, aspect of sustainability, but the use of digital twins uh, to continuously measure uh, the energy that is consumed and obviously what you can measure you can improve um, so taking it from there and again we've had fantastic demonstrations uh, already of how digital twins can help us do that across the network so that I would pick as two key examples within the sustainability um, space. Still on sustainability but moving on to perhaps more of the applications domain uh, one way uh, we're looking to improve again the efficiency over our networks is the way we deliver content uh, over our networks okay. So obviously video content is booming and we all love that and we obviously build our networks to ensure that our customers have the best uh, experience um, but it also poses challenges on, on us. Um, I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with the issue of peak, uh, you know, uh, live uh, mass uh, events uh, and obviously having to scale the capacity on your networks. So we continuously look at ways to improve that. Uh, we look at multicast delivery, it's one uh, particular technology where we have partnerships with content providers, exploring how we can actually uh, cooperate in uh, finding more efficient ways to deliver, uh, if you like, uh, live uh, traffic. But we also look at improving the way CDN uh, technologies, content delivery networks work, uh, looking to virtualize, um, obviously very relevant to this conference, virtualization in this case of the CDN market, and how we can actually make the best of the flexibility that that technology offers to again improve the efficiency of the caches and be a lot more, um, if you like, energy efficient in the way we um, deliver content over the networks. That's on the sustainability front. Um, I'll just move on to the growth and, and perhaps just speak on one example. My team are very, very close to my heart and my team. Uh, we're actually running a um, quantum key distribution uh, trial in London ah. where we, um, and we explore quantum from a number of angles. We yeah. explore how can we use quantum computing for our benefit. We can, um, how can we actually use timing and sensing as well? from a um, quantum perspective. But for this particular case, what we're looking at is using the, um, effectively the, 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 the laws of physics to exchange keys in a super secure way that cannot actually be broken because you can actually detect when somebody has tried to read effectively the photo. So, so using that laws of physics uh, makes us actually um, build uh, super secure networks which are effectively quantum safe. And that's obviously we see as a growth opportunity for us. Our, um, um, you know, our motto is connect for good uh, and that includes obviously being the most um, secure network uh, for our customers. Okay well and to be fair you know looking across the whole landscape of uh, telecom operators in the world there's no doubt that, that BT is very well advanced in terms of testing and trialing uh, quantum safe network uh, capabilities and, and of course you know um, actually starting to use these kind of technologies uh, around London with early users. So uh, th those are great developments and of course they all come stem from R&D. So congratulations to you there. 
Um, now, you mentioned where it fused, you mentioned virtualization, and you know, of course, this is a show that's a lot about disaggregation of networks as well. How does disaggregation fit into BT's R&D programs? Is this something you're looking at as well? Mm, I mean, um, yes, absolutely, and, and it's been a long journey. It's not started now. Uh, obviously, we're starting to see some new domains, if you like, applying the, uh, the uh, principles of uh, disaggregation and virtualization. But as you probably know, the journey started uh, a long time ago. Uh, and we were very heavily involved in the, the, uh, the early days of network function virtualization, which was, if, if you like, the, um, the advent of how can we actually take what is a vertically integrated appliance-based, uh, if you like, industry, which is where we were probably two decades ago, more towards the principles of you know, software-based uh, solutions, that horizontal um, disaggregation, uh, which, as I say, started um, probably over two decades ago. If I fast forward to where we are today, we are already in the middle of actually evolving our, uh, for instance, 5G core infrastructure into being fully container-based, and that's a reality, and it's happening uh, across the globe. Uh, and if I bring it back to research, and again, applying all those principles to the way we will obviously build our networks in the future, of course, no doubt, Open RAN, which is one of the key topics in this conference, is key to us. We have a number of projects uh, in the UK, collaborative projects, where we partner uh, with um, various companies to show the principles and the benefits and explore the benefits of Open RAN. Uh, but of course, there are many other parts of the network that we can look at. And we have IP router uh, disaggregation being looked at. Wi-Fi itself uh, is also going through different degrees of virtualization. But what we try to focus on is what is the real benefit. We don't yes. believe in disaggregation for the sake of uh, disaggregation. We really need to unpick what's in it for us. And it's not always just about cost, uh, or although it can, or hopefully, uh, bring uh, cost benefits. Yeah. But we believe in the benefits of a change in the way we operate our networks and build our networks, but also the commercial models around the way we build networks. So it's, it's, it's about bringing it all together in a way that makes sense for, for us and our customers. Absolutely. L lots of different uh, puzzle pieces there to, to put together. Yeah, right. But that's why you know, people are here to, to, to discuss these outcomes as yeah. well as, as how it's enabled. Now, one of the topics uh, here at this event, because uh, like you said, Open RAN is broadly discussed, but every aspect of network disaggregation is discussed here, uh, including the impact on indoor networks. Uh, what can be done to improve those incredibly important infrastructures? Because as people are constantly noticing, we do spend a lot of our time indoors. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely we do. And a lot of our content is actually consumed from indoors. So absolutely agree. Well, we happen to be uh, the largest fixed and mobile operator in the UK. So we have a foot in both camps uh, and it's in our interest to offer the best user experience wherever you are. And, and I think the, the way to look at this is not so much whether it's a DAS or a neutral host or a Wi-Fi or, or an in-home um, Wi-Fi solution, it's actually looking at every customer um, segment uh, and, and their needs. And I really think it varies, obviously, and we all know that we have a, a, a variety of uh, customer types, all the way from the uh, consumer market, uh, and depending on the, on the type of building or housing that they live in, they will need a very different type of solution. Um, so that's one uh, aspect, and what do they do within their homes with that Wi-Fi connectivity, and how can we help them manage their Wi-Fi uh, needs in, in, in a better way? Or it might actually come to the actual applications that you're using within the house. So whether it's gaming, whether it's immersive experiences, we're talking a lot about the metaverse. We think a lot of that needs to evolve. The connectivity actually needs to provide the best use, the best connectivity for the best for, for each um, use case. That's the consumer market. For the enterprise market, it's fascinating. There is such a range of uh, opportunities and, and challenges to overcome. You could look at this venue and of course, you know, we have Wi-Fi here, but then you come in and out and then you might lose the Wi-Fi and you connect to the cellular network outdoors and then you're roaming. So how does that work? So, so there is a lot of complexity, but that's, that makes it uh, actually a, an opportunity uh, to solve that complexity. And again, I keep back coming back to the, the user experience has to be key. What do people in this venue need? And we're all guests uh, in this Wi-Fi network. So what do we need from this um, connectivity? And ob obviously, what does the venue owner want to provide to us while we're here? And then you can look at airports, you can look at ports, you can look at all these different, um, if you like, needs effectively for the enterprise market. I really think there is plenty of technical components to make that happen. We, we operators and the whole ecosystem, not just the operators, need to bring it all together to make sense for the customer needs. Okay. 
And in, in terms of improving that experience, is it more about the, uh, you know, faster throughput and, and, and greater coverage, or is it more about the management of these networks and the management of the, how the customer engages with those services? Yeah, it's, it's got to be a, a bit of both, I'm afraid. Uh, of course, capacity has to be there almost as a given uh, for all the traffic to be uh, carried over the network. Uh, but we do need to improve the way, the intelligence layer, if you like, the way we actually give the right connectivity to the right customer. So uh, they're not mutually exclusive. Uh, we need all of the above. I ultimately think that customers want the reliability uh, and they want the seamless experience. And the more intelligence and management we can add to give each individual customer what they need, that's effectively the opportunity for, to grow as a market and, and to offer the best uh, possible uh, customer okay. experience. Well, that certainly seems to be an area where the, there are some gains to be made and some, uh, and some real opportunities. Now, of course, one of the really hot topics in the industry right now um, is the impact and potential use of artificial intelligence. To what extent do you think is the current hype around AI justified? Can it have a, a massive impact on the communication network services sector? Hmm. It's interesting, every, every technology has its own hype cycles. We're, we're all familiar with that, I think. But of course, there is no doubt that there are huge uh, technological advances happening in that space. Um, from a BT perspective, um, obviously AI is not new. We have been uh, exploring it for decades uh, again, and we probably already all um, companies, not just BT, use AI in different ways and forms. Yeah. Um, but of course, it, the, coming back to the new advances, of course, we need to look at them with uh, as an opportunity, uh, but of course with responsibility. Uh, and that's something that is very important to us. So we look at the consumption of AI as an ethical and a responsible um, um, way to, to use this new technology. Um, generative AI is one of probably one of the most uh, advanced uh, technology advancements of the, of the decade. Uh, but as I said, we need to embrace it with uh, care uh, and, and making sure we understand the risk to ourselves and to our customers and make sure we maintain the integrity, the security, the reliability of our networks. Of course, we're also looking at the wider AI. Um, how can we use it again, coming back to the way we operate our networks? Um, we believe in combining human intelligence with artificial intelligence um, to um, actually make people's jobs much more interesting uh, and also to create new jobs that we cannot even imagine uh, just yet. At the same time, improving the way we operate our networks. I was talking about sustainability and, uh, and energy reduction. That's definitely one area where we think uh, we should be using the power of AI. But there are many other ways in which we, uh, we are looking at, at responsible use of AI uh, to manage our networks. Okay. Uh, and I'm just curious, when something, you know, because generative AI was something that was only talked about by you know, real industry experts a year ago, and then all of a sudden everybody's talking about it. In these kind of instances where something like that just comes to, comes to the fore and comes to the attention of, of everybody, including, you know, board level and senior executive level in the company, do they turn to teams like yourselves and go, can you get on this now and figure out what this means for us? Is that how it works? Or does it come to you? Um, well, it would if it wasn't already there. We have been already exploring AI, as I said. On for, generative uh, AI, <laughs> particularly. Yeah. Well, on generative AI specifically, actually, we have an entire team that looks at the responsible use of okay. uh, that technology. So, so it's, not, is... it's not new because we come to a conference like this no, and no, we no, discover... No. If you but this is something yeah. that sprung up pretty quickly at the it, end of last year as a result as of it, the... Absolutely. Okay. As, as it has... Actually, probably before we made the big kind of news, we, ca we had people obviously knowing about the evolution of the technology who can help us if you like understand what it means for us so it's it's not necessarily it's, it's probably well before it hits the news uh, that we because we have industry uh, collaborations we have academic uh, academic uh, relationships uh, and we know pretty much not everything that's going on inside those uh, closed doors but we know the state of the technology and and we can pretty well adapt very quickly yeah. <laughs> to to the way things are changing. Okay. Yeah. Well, that, that, that's good to know because obviously Chat GPT, when it came to the public imagination, that wasn't its first iteration. Uh, I think it was the third. Yeah, so yeah, it, so it, exactly. It had, it had been around there for a while. Going around here, going to the sessions, talking to people at, at Fuse this year, 
what are your main takeaways? What, what's really piqued your interest in the conversations you've had here? Um, I, I think, um, well, there is no doubt that things like o Open RAN and, you know, a few other, if you like, key topics um, tend to overtake, if you like, the, uh, the conversation. AI obviously being the, uh, the other one. I would say on Open RAN, um, I really think what's sinking in is the way the benefits from Open RAN can only come if we, back to the previous conversation, bring together the operational uh, aspects as well as the commercial. Aspects and, and I think this is true of any, if you like, new technology. You, you, sh we shouldn't be looking at it as a replacement to the old technology. If you think of it that way, you're definitely not exploiting uh, the full uh, benefits of it. And I think what we're seeing here is enough examples. You know, it's still early days, but we're seeing a lot of, uh, you know, people out there with, you know, live network trials who are already demonstrating those benefits, but into the mindset of effectively changing the way we operate and build and plan our networks. And I think that sinking in is, is something we obviously we have been exploring for quite some time. But seeing that um, happening already, seeing a lot of uh, really good examples across the globe and seeing a lot more industry coming together to make that happen, uh, it's a very promising picture. OK, fantastic. Well, Maria, it's been great to hear, you know, there's so many different uh, angles and, and, and focus areas that BT is taking in its R&D. So thanks for taking the time to talk to us today. No problem. Thank you.